I think most of Americans are actually victims of some kind. A lot of this is scapegoating, right? I mean, when you have a country that doesn't have social democracy and everyone, you know, basically lives, you know, kind of one paycheck away from uh, leaving the middle class if they're in the middle class, there's this kind of haze of fear that kind of hangs over everyday life. And it's just very easy to kind of, um, when people are scared, and they're feeling fear, uncertainty, and doubt, they're easy to manipulate. That's a basic public relations principle. And conservatives are able to kind of say, well, the the bad guy is not your boss. The bad guy is over there. The bad guy is not me running the country. It's because they won't let me do what I do. Even with all this power that that you guys have given me, we're still finding our will sapped by these internal enemies, whether it's a a liberal media or communist infiltration or uh, the new Black Panther Party or whatever it is. Probably one of the most remarkable feats of political rhetoric he pulls off when he's governor of California is that as Watergate is blowing Uh up, Uh He doesn't put any distance between himself and Richard Nixon. He makes repeatedly remarks that basically amount to boys will be boys. I didn't even give a second thought when I found out that those who were experienced in campaigning were frequently checking our headquarters uh, to make sure that it had not been bugged. And this was just accepted that these type of things and tricks of this kind and false mailings and so forth Right. He says that the Watergate burglars are, quote unquote, not criminals at heart. And it was a shame that they had to go to jail. All kinds of stuff. He says that it's a liberal witch hunt and a lynching that's trying to reverse the mandate of 1972. He says Watergate doesn't matter. He says the Democrats are worse. And if you can see what goes on in Chicago in a reelection, you'd be shocked. He says we haven't gotten the full story even after Nixon resigns. He says he can't understand the tapes. He says all kinds of things, but all amounts to one thing, that uh, he's not going to criticize Richard Nixon because he sees the world in terms of good guys and bad guys. And he sees Richard Nixon as one of the good guys. Now, one of the most fascinating documents I came across in my research was a column by kind of the two biggest columnists, syndicated political columnists of the day, um, Roland Evans and Robert Novak, who were pretty liberal then, but turned out to be pretty strong Reaganites by the end. But anyway, two months before Nixon um, resigns, when you know his approval rating is literally 20%, they do a column about how all Ronald Reagan's political handlers who wanted to make him president, you know, the 1976 election, two years away, excuse me, are freaking out because Reagan won't distance himself from Nixon. And it's just so obvious. It's so self-evident that this is the this, the the threshold that any politician has to pass in order to be taken seriously by the electorate. And my interpretation of that is they don't understand the cultural ground shifting underneath their feet. That amidst the chaos of Watergate, all the moral morass, all the confusion, all the humiliations of losing in Vietnam, the energy crisis, America's economic might kind of draining away, circling the drain as they speak, that Ronald Reagan's ability to kind of stout-hearted certainty and clarity in the midst of this morass that other people see only as chaos is exactly what makes him so attractive to the electorate. His ability to say everything is all right, we can trust our leaders, and that we're governed by noble people. And that is the invisible bridge that he crosses to the White House. He kind of hits the national stage with an insurgent primary challenge to Gerald Ford in 1976. Uh What happens? What goes down in Kansas City? Well, it's a fascinating thing because, of course, he's challenging an incumbent president, albeit one who wasn't elected. But there's not been a successful challenge to a sitting president for a nomination since Chester Arthur. And uh, he, at first, um, loses a bunch of primaries. But then as he kind of picks up uh, the issue of kind of America's humiliation after uh, Vietnam in uh, the Panama Canal Treaty that's being negotiated by Gerald Ford, very much this kind of right-wing populist vision that unseen elites are selling off America's property piece by piece, he begins to gain momentum in places like Texas, in places like North Carolina, 
aided by a right-wing grassroots insurgency the mainstream media doesn't even know about or understand. Direct mail, like uh, Richard Vigory, Jesse Helms has a political machine that he's running in North Carolina that's more powerful than even the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. So suddenly he starts winning primaries. And by the time they get to the, the showdown in Kansas City, it's the last political convention we've had in which the outcome wasn't determined in advance. And it was a melodrama. And it was great TV and it was full of anger and it was full of passion. At one moment, Nelson Rockefeller, who's the vice president of the United States, tears up a, a Ronald Reagan sign on camera. And a delegate from Utah, who's a Mormon minister, rips the New York delegation's telephone out of the floor. And it's bedlam. And poor Bob Dole has the gavel and he's trying to run the convention and no one will shut up. And there's all these confrontations between the fans of Betty Ford and the fans of Nancy Reagan and all this backroom machinations. And they're trying to pry delegates loose. And it's just labyrinthine and fascinating. Now, who's organizing that grassroots conservatism? Well, you know, the fascinating thing about one of the things I found out about the campaign, the Reagan campaign, is there was even a civil war within the Reagan campaign. There was kind of the official Reagan campaign that had a very sort of tactical strategy for um, getting the nomination. And then there were people led by Jesse Helms who were really angry that the official campaign was not trying to win by um, making the most conservative platform possible. So you really have a very complicated kind of hydra headed beast. Ronald Reagan like any successful politician is running a coalition. Who's behind it? There's plenty of wealthy backers. In fact, Ronald Reagan raised the most money of any of the candidates, including uh, Jimmy Carter in that primary season. And a lot of big businesses for Ford because he's the guy who can deliver the contracts and he does so in, in quantity. Ronald Reagan says that his campaign theme was Santa Claus is coming to town. But Ronald Reagan has these kind of scrappy entrepreneurial minded uh, businessmen who see themselves as being put upon by the federal Leviathan, right? And you have a lot of this emerging right-wing infrastructure that's really good at kind of manipulating kind of ground-level grievances and turning it into passion and organizational muscle and money. So it's kind of the people who, for example, um, get into politics in the first time in a place like um, Kanawha County, West Virginia, right, which is where Charleston is. And in 1974, the school board introduces these new textbooks that they see as defiling Christian faith because they, for example, teach about mythology. Just to take a very, just a specific example. Well, very soon there's this grassroots attack on the school board. It ends up with people actually dynamiting the school board. But how it's relevant to the bigger story of American politics is this new think tank based in Washington, the Heritage Foundation, which is funded almost exclusively by a very wealthy beer baron, the Coors family, shows up and organizes them and gets them in touch with other people who are mad about their schools and mad about these supposed liberal elites who are kind of challenging the authority of Christian faith in the family. And these are the kind of people who find themselves on mailing lists, right? And begin to get appeals from the Ronald Reagan campaign saying, send us $10, send us $20, send us $50. Or if they give away the Panama Canal, they'll be giving away Omaha next, right? And that is a very important part of the historical story I'm starting to tell because you you have institutions that transcend any particular political campaign or political movement that are basically a permanent campaign, right? And that's kind of the forebears of what the Koch brothers are doing now. And some of this is top down. America's business elites are kind of reorganizing and hitching their yoke to right wing politics. That's right. And you see a figure like uh, William Simon, who's a very important figure in the history of a conservative right, who was Gerald Ford's treasury secretary. And he's the guy who says, when New York City is going bankrupt, this is all the fault of spendthrift liberals and we can't give them a penny, right? And he's rep he's kind of speaking for the bankers and corporate elites who used to kind of buy into the center left consensus that we needed kind of a Keynesian system that kind of delivers money into the hands of ordinary workers and sees activist government as an important partner in the success of business. But you begin to see People led like figures like um, William Simon, uh, Lewis Powell, the future Supreme Court justice who writes the famous Powell memo saying, look, we need to organize big 
major blue chip corporations to dismantle the institutions of liberalism. And that's also something new that you begin to see in the 70s. So you have this coalition. The voice of a historian, Rick Perlstein. This is a conversation we recorded four years ago, um, just as Donald Trump was starting to become the standard bearer of the Republican Party. Now Rick Perlstein is out with a brand new book called Reagan Land, America's Right Turn from 1976 to 1980, which I have to say, I'm not an incredible history buff, but this is like a page turner. I learned so much from going through the book and he writes with such narrative flair that it's hard to put down. Um, It's one of the very few thank you gifts that we're able to offer this fun drive uh, by a special arrangement with a fulfillment house that will send it right to you. If you pledge $200, Um, probably sounds like a lot. It is a lot of book. It's over 1,100 pages in hardcover at 1-800-439-5732. For that pledge, you will also get KPFA's Don't Believe the Hype political history collection, which includes this interview in its full length form, along with Mitch Jezerich's interview with Rick Perlstein on the new book that I just described, along with 16 other interviews and talks that we think represent the best of what KPFA has to bring to this moment in history. Uh, Roxanne dunbar Ortiz on the history of the Second Amendment, Blair Amani on the Great Migration, Cornell West on the Radical MLK, Richard Wolf from Economic Update on Understanding Socialism, Jason Stanley on How Fascism Works. Marxian geographer Richard Walker on the dark shadow of the tech industry in the Bay Area. Rebecca Solnit on finding hope in the dark. Uh, Along with more current events interviews, Greg Pallast on what Trump allies are doing to steal the 2020 election. It is a political education tool that we would love to put in your hand. Um, The political history collection from KPFA is an audio collection we send to you electronically. uh, As long as you give an email when you pledge. You can stream these interviews and KPFA events. You can download them. You can load them on your phone as a podcast. You will get them for any amount you pledge, whether it is 25 bucks for a basic membership or 200 bucks for this book, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. I've got about 60 seconds left and I want to let you know how we're doing. Uh, One listener in Foster City surprised us by offering an extremely large challenge for this time of the day. Uh, This donor is prepared to double $1,000 if we can raise at least that much. So far we have raised 545. We're down to 16 minutes left in the hour. We'll spend most of that back in the interview. We've got just one caller on the line So we're asking you to join them. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. All right. Back to the interview with Rick Perlstein. Now, William Simons is a fascinating figure. Amazing Um, guy. City of New York, which is losing a lot of money, comes to him as Treasury Secretary and says... We need help. Our interest rates are shooting too high. The Treasury needs to step in and buy some of our municipal bonds. Right. He says we couldn't possibly do that just a few years prior. Yes, he's been selling municipal bonds (laughs) to New York. (laughs) He's been and buying municipal bonds from New York when he's working in the private sector. That's right. But he said he said that he was he was duped by cunning bureaucrats. I mean, it's always it's always something, right? Well, which is the same rhetorical tool that you were describing, Reagan, exactly pointing so well. Yes, that's really interesting. The New York fiscal crisis that takes place in in uh, it's amazing stuff. People burning trash in the streets of New York. You know, cops going on strike and basically like throwing rocks at other cops. They call scabs. It really looks like civilization is unraveling in the greatest city in the world. And it's also a point at which you basically see a very large government. New York's economy is about the size of 20 other states combined. Right. Put at the mercy of large banking interests. And it's very true. And in, in, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, there's a really good book called Working Class New York by a historian named Joshua Freeman. And he basically points out how New York decided to have socialism in one city. I mean, they had free hospitals. They had free college. They had basically subsidized middle class housing. They had daycare. And yes, it was expensive. 
But a lot of the reason why this stuff kind of fell apart was forces beyond New York's control. And the tax laws changed that favored investing or investing in third world resource rich con- countries instead of municipal, bo- municipal bonds, all sorts of things. It's it's complicated, but it can, again, turns into this melodrama of crystalline moral clarity in which some very opportunistic bankers begin to say, wow, it's time for us to call the tune here. And, you know, I find some smoking guns about that. It's really, you sound, find some language that's almost identical to what Naomi Klein is adduced as the shock doctrine. And what you spell out so well in the book is that it's not about stabilizing New York's finances. It's about changing who's in control. That's right. It's about breaking the back of liberalism. This is the period where New York City University System, which is the largest uh, community college system in the country, starts charging tuition for right. the first and, time. And that's uh, that's straight out of the Ronald Reagan playbook, because when he becomes governor in 67, that's one of his first acts. He says the state should not subsidize intellectual creativity, and they start charging tuition at the University of California system. This is the first time we see people in politics really start championing austerity budgets. Very much so austerity turned into a type of politics. That's right. And aided and abetted by certain Democratic politicians, like our own friend Jerry Brown, who very much was an avatar of what I call in the book hair shirt patriotism. The idea that we're spending too much, we're expecting too much, we have to confront an age of limits, you know, all the kind of union heads and uh, professional liberals in Sacramento were so excited when Pat Brown's son got elected because they thought that they were back in the Catburg seat in Sacramento. But they discovered that this guy didn't want to spend money on anything. And, uh, you know, he was taking away the free briefcases that, you know, kind of middle managers got and things like that. He was reading, you know, neoconservative policy magazines. And he was talking about environmental authors like A.L. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. But he was also saying that he uh, really liked what he was reading about uh, commentary, about the wastefulness of the liberal state. It's so interesting reading that, that chapter on the New York fiscal crisis um, is to compare it to what's happening in Detroit today. Right. Where explicitly, literally, control of the city has been taken away right. from its elected officials and be, been placed in the hand of an emergency right. manager. And, 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 you know, it's, I, I, I'm a, I, I love Detroit. I, I went there for vacation, which not many people can say this, this, this summer. And I love the spirit of the people in Detroit. And I was just, at a certain point, it just kind of all came together for me so clearly. The ideological outrage that's going on there. Here's this city that was the arsenal of democracy. You know, they were producing 500 planes a day in those factories. That's how we defeated Hitler, because of places like Detroit. And through no fault of its own, you have white flight. All the money drains out to the suburbs. We think of Detroit as a very poor place, as, and it is. But you immediately cross one road, eight-mile road, the, the division between uh, Oakland County and Detroit, and it goes from privation to luxury literally across the street. So this is not some natural thing. This was an ideological thing. The rich people just left and they said, we're going to leave you to die. And when the country needed Detroit, it exploited it for for all it's worth. And now that we don't need Detroit, we're completely willing to throw these people away. And the idea that there's not even a discussion of a federal bailout for a municipal government that is failing mostly through no fault of its own but because it's been victimized by forces beyond its, its control is just a profound, profound, uh, speaks profoundly to our own um, moral failings as a nation. Speaking with Rick Perlstein, best-selling author of what is now a trilogy and soon to be a tetralogy. A tetralogy. Of dun, books dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Is that the theme music from Tetris? That's the Tetris, yeah. Wow. <laughs> the theme music to this uh, this book is, by the way, uh, uh, Funky President by James Brown. It's, a, it's the only James Brown song about Gerald Ford that I'm aware of. <laughs> the book is called The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon, and The Rise of Reagan. I want to talk a little bit about the reaction to the book. As I said, this is your third book about the right. Mm-hmm. The first one's about Barry Goldwater. Right. Praise across the board, including from people on the right. Second book about Richard Nixon accolades in the right-wing press. This book comes out about the rise of Reagan, and no sooner does it hit the stands than Craig Shirley, Uh a right-wing writer whose work you praise in the book, 
is out making baseless accusations of plagiarism. Right. Because your end notes attributing his work are on your web page instead of the book to prevent Pretty it from it. being yeah. 300 pages longer. But this gets picked up in the right wing media echo chamber. And this yeah. is the dominant narrative about this book. So I guess uh, my question is. Why is Reagan different to the right in this country? Yeah. Why can they tolerate an honest and detailed book about Goldwater and Nixon, but not Reagan? Right. Well, uh, <clears throat> a very uh, interesting writer, Dave Weigel, who wrote for Slate and now is going to Bloomberg News, but he was he's a great reporter on the right, about the right. And he has a roots in the libertarian movement, but I would, I would now call him an idiosyncratic liberal, said, you know, Goldwater was a martyr. Nixon was a hated figure and Reagan is a god. And why is Reagan a god um, when he's, like I said, such a complicated figure? If you think about it. I think he actually said Nixon was the martyr. Oh, Nixon was the martyr. What did he say about Goldwater? <laughs> I think Goldwater was a saint. Saint or something. Yeah, the saint, the <laughs> martyr, and the, the and then the god, right? Who else are they going to admire as their hero? You know, Eisenhower, Ford, Nixon. And so Reagan is kind of the only kind of presidential hero that they got. And... But it kind of like it it, 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 it's, it's ironically very gratifying to me because it affirms the very first thesis of the book, which is that Reagan is just a fundamentally polarizing figure. And the people who identify him as a hero uh, see him as he wishes to be seen, as a rescuer, as a rescuer, a person who can make all contradictions melt away. Someone who makes them feel good. And to present him as a figure of complexity, not attacking him, but figuring, just representing him as a figure of complexity. I, I will note that in this interview on multiple occasions, you've defended his sincerity. Yes. The idea that he is someone you have to think about instead of making him the foundation of your being, the ground of your political identity, is discomforting at a deep, deep level to a lot of people. And it reminds me of um, something that um, Senator Al Franken said. A lot of conservatives, I he probably said our conservative friends, love their country like a child loves their mommy. Right? That means sees them as this larger than life, perfect being that cannot be challenged without it being seen simultaneously as a challenge upon themselves. And uh, that's what Ronald Reagan has become for the American right. And it's not necessarily a very healthy thing for uh, their political future. I'm old enough to remember when every Democratic primary season had the Kennedy figure, right? The, it was Joe Biden. It was even Jimmy Carter when he ran for governor of Georgia in 1970. And when he ran in 1976, they had a picture that kind of made him look like John F. Kennedy. And that kind of hero worship is probably something to do with why they've had such a bad job of kind of developing talent that they can sell to the rest of the country. And no one can live up to that ideal. Not the person, but the ideal. It's the voice of historian Rick Perlstein. It's an interview we recorded four years ago when he had just released his book, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. It's just out with a new book called Reagan Land, America's Right Turn from 1976 to 1980. My name is Brian Edwards Teagert, um, and I'm jumping in here because we have just six minutes left in the hour and a job to do. KBFA needs to pay its bills. It takes money to bring you interviews like the one you just listened to and to get them up on the public airwaves for a mass audience. Our managers have gone above and beyond to try to raise money off air so we could shrink the goals and, and the size of these fund drives. But we still have about $450,000 to raise if we are going to pay our bills. And we want to raise it quickly so we can go full bore into election coverage with the resources we need to have an impact. Now, because of the pandemic, we can't use a lot of our traditional fundraising gimmicks. And because of the news, um, we're just not going to suspend regular coverage to, to change to a fundraising format. And because of the recession, a lot of people who we would normally count on to give generously are either broke or worried about being broke in the near future. Probably more than at any point in our existence. So I'm putting this out to those of you who are doing okay. 
you still got your income coming in. Cash to stimulus check you didn't really need. Um, especially if you're someone who's been listening for a while and has never pledged before. This is when we need you to step up. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732 or pledge online through our website, kpfa.org. Now, here's where we stand. Um, We had one listener surprise us with a $1,000 challenge. There is someone standing by in Foster City who will give an extra $1,000 to the station if we can match them by the end of the hour. As of this minute, we are $190 away from making it. But we're also down to our final four minutes with only one caller on the line. We're asking you to join that person. Giving to KPFA is an act of solidarity with everyone who counts on this radio station. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. We're asking you to join Dan, who just pledged from San Francisco. Steve, who pledged from Oakland. Camille, who pledged from Cloverdale. She says, it feels good to donate. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Join Cindy in Daly City and Janine in San Francisco and Simon in Richmond and Vicky in San Francisco and Gail in Petaluma and Dea in San Francisco and Ira in Pleasant Hill. Um, those are all the folks who pledged to get the first $810 towards that $1,000 challenge. And we're asking you to make sure that their efforts have not been in vain. 1-800-439-5732. You know, KPFA is like a giant leap of faith. It's a collective action. KPFA only exists because for the 71 years that comprise this radio station's history, people have been giving a little bit, knowing that it won't be enough to keep KPFA going unless other people answer the call and do the same. We all place our faith in each other when we give our money, when we give our time, when we give our attention to this incredible institution, the world's first listener-supported radio station. Uh, We're asking you to come through for everyone who's already pledged this hour and taken that leap of faith, and everyone who counts on this radio station during one of the most trying periods of its history by calling 1-800-439-5732. Now we're up to five callers on the line and down to our final minute and 43 seconds at 1-800-439-5732. Remember, any amount you pledge, this is a sweetener. Uh, You will get KPFA's carefully curated political history collection. Uh, It is 18 KPFA events. Uh, and in-depth interviews like the one you just heard with Rick Perlstein. 1-800-439-5732. Here is the phone number one final time. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Thank you so much to everyone who's calling right now. Stay tuned. This is Adrian Lobby. Thanks to Rod Akeel, our regular engineer, Josh Elwood, and the entire Pushing Limits gang. And thank you for listening. Pushing Limits is produced by a collective of people with disabilities. Contact us by email at pushinglimits, all one word, at kpfa.org. Our website is pushinglimitsradio.org, and we're on Facebook as Pushing Limits Radio. Next week, this time, tune in to Education Today with Kitty Kelly Epstein. We'll see you in two. Not Dying With You Tonight is a compelling new novel about two girls, one black, one white, who must confront their own assumptions about racism. 
co-authored by Kimberly Jones. It's an incendiary examination of privilege, racial tension, violence, and finding friends in surprising places. As timely as it is addictive, says the New York Times. Kimberly Jones will be in a Zoom webinar with Davey D of KPFA's Hard Knock Radio on Tuesday evening, October 20th, 7 p.m. The webinar link is on the KPFA website under events. Kimberly Jones, October 20th. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24 8BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you. 